case at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Let's begin with a live look outside with City Cam. Our string of showers this week continuing today with a lot of places getting some rain, sometimes coming in heavy downpours, but not everybody got that rain. If you didn't, don't worry. It could still happen. Meteorologist Adam Kasky tracking more rain chances. We'll check in with him in just a bit. Now to a big story we're following today. A 40 year prison sentence handed down in connection with the death of eight month old King J. Davila two and a half years after the baby's body was found. His stepfather, 37 year old Christopher Davila, found guilty of injury to a child causing death. He must serve at least half of that 40 year sentence before he's eligible for parole. Authorities believe that King J died January 4th, 2019, the same day that Davila and other family members allegedly staged King J's kidnapping from a West Side gas station. Beatrice Sampaio, Davila's mother, and Angie Torres, Davila's cousin, both face tampering with evidence charges in connection with this case. Disturbing accusations made in a lawsuit filed against Trinity University. The estate of former student Kaylee Mandotti and her mother are claiming the university could have prevented her death back in 2017. Also named in that lawsuit, Mark Howerton, the man accused of killing Mandotti. Eric Hernandez has more details about this case. This 21 page complaint is accusing Trinity University of refusal to respond to multiple reports of stalking, abuse, intimidation, domestic violence, and gender based discrimination, which resulted in the death of 19 year old Kaylee Mendotti. Filed yesterday in the 225th Bear County District Court by Allison Steele, Mendotti's mother, on behalf of the estate of Kaylee Mendotti, this lawsuit goes over several accusations where the university failed to protect her. One situation in particular that occurred on September 24, 2017, a little over a month before Mandati's death. According to the lawsuit, on that day, campus police were called to her dorm room. Howerton had entered her dorm when she wasn't there, ransacked it, threw her possessions off the balcony, and was heard threatening to smash Mandati's face and or to commit significant bodily harm to her. According to that court document, Trinity police officers let Howerton go and banned him from campus. Later, Mandati was held responsible for the damages to her dorm and was subject to a disciplinary hearing where she was blamed for the incident. Afterward, the complaint states Howerton was observed five more times on surveillance at her dorm leading up to her death. Now, we reached out to Trinity University and they said they could not comment on pending litigation. As for the lawsuit, the Mandati estate is seeking a million dollars in monetary relief. As for Mark Howerton, his retrial is not expected until later this summer. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. They were the first to close during the pandemic and not so often the last to reopen live performance venues like bars and theaters. The Save Our Stages Act opened the door to the Shuttered Venues Grant Program back in April. It's already providing a much needed lifeline for venue owners. Today, Senator John Cornyn, a co-sponsor of that legislation, stopped by San Antonio to visit with some who are getting those funds. John Paul Barajas with that story. It's music to venue owners' ears everywhere. Live in-person music and entertainment is slowly making its way back. But many have had to close their doors for good. Others were, and some still are, hanging on by a thread. Just weeks where we thought, I don't see any way out of this. As we were down over 85% of our revenues were gone last year. 15 months of no indoor shows. So we're just now getting into that again. This, this is huge for us. It was a common theme of shared struggles and optimism at today's round table as venue owners shared stories with Senator John Cornyn, who authored the bipartisan bill. According to Senator John Cornyn, over 100 Texas businesses, like here, Jazz Texas, have already received help from the Shuttered Venues Grant Program. $91 million has already been used and $16 billion was made available. The program is currently scheduled to run through the end of the year, but Cornyn says if more help is needed, he would vote to extend it. He also encourages anyone who needs assistance to apply sooner rather than later. Someone who's done that and already started getting funds, Garrett T. Capps, owner of the Lonesome Rose. We're cool. We're a cool place to hang out. <laughs> we spoke to him a while back about his cool place, and in his own words, times were brutal. And even with the help, he has no idea when they'll be fully recovered. But he adds he has no complaints. We're just pushing forward as efficiently as we can. Just stay open, keep the doors open, keep the music going. And have a good time. Woo! John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. 
A top federal official complimenting San Antonio and Bear County's vaccination program today. The secretary for the Department of Homeland Security toured the mass vaccination site at the Wonderland of the Americas this afternoon. Though federal statistics show the country as a whole is still shy of meeting President Joe Biden's goal of 70 percent of adults receiving at least partial vaccinations by July 4th. Local numbers show Bear County has hit that mark. Garrett Berger joins us now live at the vaccination site. And Garrett, what did the secretary have to say today? Well, Tim, after a quick tour of this site, Secretary Mallorca said that at uh, local officials' efforts, I told or he praised the local officials' efforts, rather, and told members in the media that San Antonio's ability to get shots into arms is resulting in the city returning to normalcy quicker. So, who do we beat out and how do we stack up? The Centers for Disease Control say 66.2% of American adults have gotten at least one dose of the vaccine so far. Now, Metro Health, on the other hand, says 72.6% of the county has received at least one jab of the vaccine. Comparing the data isn't all apples to apples, though. The feds talk about vaccinated adults, while Metro Health's numbers include everyone 12 and up. Still, DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas said the city is a model for others who haven't achieved that same success. Though the mayor cautioned San Antonio is not done yet. We aren't isolated, and we, are, we all know that the virus is circulating, including the alarming Delta variant. They're still out there. While the Delta variant has been confirmed in Austin, but not yet in San Antonio, public health experts assume it's already here. State statistics show 57.5% of Texans 12 and up have at least one dose of the vaccine. However, unlike the stats provided locally through Metro Health, the state's numbers don't include doses that service members or veterans receive through the Department of Defense or through Veteran Affairs. Now, local and, uh, and federal officials stress the importance of getting your vaccine. There are clinics still open, like this one here at Wonderland of the Americas. Live Wonderland of the Americas, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. All right, thanks, Garrett. We have now learned the name of a man who was hit and killed while trying to cross Loop 410 Saturday night. 36-year-old Michael Anthony Tees was hit by a car crossing just east of Fredericksburg in a place where police say pedestrians aren't allowed. According to officers, the driver of that car did stop, tried to help, called 911. That person will not be facing any charges. A woman facing an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon charge after police say she attacked her ex-girlfriend with an ax. 27 year old Samantha Daanda was arrested Monday, but the alleged assault actually happened on Friday. According to police, Daanda and the other woman got into an argument. According to the arrest report, Daanda went and got an ax, then swung it at the alleged victim's head, hitting the wall behind her. She then grabbed the ax and threw it across the room before trying to leave. Police say the woman had been hit in the head with the flat part of the ax and had a cut on her arm. She told police that Daanda had threatened to chop her up. Bond has been set for $30,000. New at six, a dust covered scrapbook still had a little glimmer to it, enough that an amateur historian saw it out of the corner of her eye. It was in a storage space being cleared out by the owner of a popular Eastside Burger joint. That scrapbook was a leftover item that didn't sell at a recent estate sale. So it was about to be tossed out when that amateur historian bought it for five bucks. Jesse Degollado picks up the story from there. Leon Henry Goldberg. The name inscribed on a scrapbook belonging to a New York cardiologist, as Lisa Jackson would soon discover within its fragile pages, along with so much more. I found myself talking to the book, and I'm like, Dr. Goldberg! <laughs> Between his 1902 birth certificate and his 1962 obituary in the New York Times, Jackson learned Goldberg had quite a life. As a Jewish American, he'd volunteered in the midst of the Holocaust, earning a World War II commendation after a military field hospital was bombed. Major Goldberg then organized a digging detail composed of his four enlisted men using their helmets and bare hands. Back home, he had a wife and son. So he carried this picture with him throughout World War II. As a proponent of African-American history, Jackson says this newspaper story caught her eye. That was amazing. Jewish Americans speaking at the NAACP. Each clipping, each photo, every glimpse into his life, his hobbies, his travels, revealed a man who Jackson wishes she had met. But there's still so much Jackson doesn't know. 
It is truly a mystery. The scrapbook had been hidden away in this storage room for who knows how long. How is it here in San Antonio? If Goldberg lived, worked, and is buried in New York, how did his book of life end up at an estate sale on San Antonio's east side? Why? Why would you get rid of it? What happened? Maybe something tragic happened to the family. I'm just wondering, how did the family lose this book? And do they want it back? Because I want to give it back to them. Memories of a life well lived that she says were just moments away from going in the trash. I do think I was there for a reason. Just for Dr. Goldberg. Jesse DeGoyado, KSAT 12 News. Jackson says her hope here is that Dr. Goldberg's descendants will hear about her discovery so they can have his scrapbook to cherish. If no one comes forward, Jackson says she plans to donate it to a synagogue or a Jewish history museum. Look outside with live cam right now, 78 degrees out there, plenty of clouds. It's almost like you could see the rain all around in some areas today, Adam. I, I'm assuming you didn't get hit in your neighborhood. <laughs> <was not> <laughs> okay, yeah, because a lot of other, several other folks did get hit and they got hit by a nice uh, swath of rain. Actually, the airport picked up over half an inch, 0.57 today. And because of the rain, we only made it to 87 degrees for the high temperature where the average is 93. We'll make it back up to average in in a couple of days, but take a look at the south side of Bear County, just over an inch measured there. This posted to our KSAT Weather Authority app, and we love getting those storm pin photos. Here's the radar over the past four hours. You see that nice swath that went right through central part of San Antonio and other parts of our area, especially west of town, still getting some decent rainfall, some good soaking maintenance rain out there. Temperatures have dropped off 70s for met for most of us. You valley 79 Rio Medina 76. Meanwhile, 83 in New Braunfels. If you didn't get the rain today, you have more chances. We're going to talk more about that and 4th of July coming up. The 40 year old condo collapse in Florida has us wondering what went wrong and could it happen here at 10? We talked to a UTSA structural engineer who tells us building inspections might change in the future. Relief is coming soon for residents in a northwest side neighborhood looking for a safer way to get around. The city is creating a new shared use path on Braun Road, path for bikers, walkers, joggers. Our Samuel King joins us now. So Samuel, this is just one of many areas in San Antonio that does not have sidewalks. Yeah, that's right, Tim and Myra. There are hundreds of miles in Council District 7 alone that don't have sidewalks. This project just one small step toward closing that gap. Yeah, I've been living here for about 20 years, and it's gotten more dangerous every year. It's getting more dangerous. Alfredo Calderon frequently bikes along Braun Road near the Camino Bandera subdivision. One, two, three. He was among the neighbors looking on as the city of San Antonio broke ground on a new shared use path for cyclists and pedestrians that will run from Bandera Road to Tezel Road. It also will provide a safer connection to nearby O.P. Schnabel Park. You got to walk on the road. It's dangerous. It's not safe. You get further up towards Bandera Road. It's even worse because there's tree limbs and bushes. Since 2017, when I came into office, this was one of the first things I heard about. Well, actually, I'll tell you, all over the district, people want sidewalks. They want to be able to move safely. This area, not the only one in San Antonio that needs more sidewalks. According to the city, District 3 has a gap of 288 miles. Anna Sandoval is council member for District 7, which has the second largest gap at 239 miles. What do you think needs to happen to sort of sort of close those gaps in your district? We need to dedicate the funding to it. Uh, so that means we're going to have to give up something else or when the bond time comes, we're going to have to prioritize that. But it's not going to happen without a concerted effort on our part. So this one mile stretch is just a start. But for these neighbors, it will go a long way towards safety. This sidewalk is going to save my life, man. It's going to keep us out of trouble. Now, the project costs about $1.5 million and should be completed by March of 2022, so in the spring of next year. As for this evening's traffic, taking a look at 1604 at 151, we do have a situation here, a crash there uh, toward that on-ramp, so let's take a closer look at that. Here is where the action is, and there is the delay. 
So that's going to be impacting your travel or if you're about to head out there uh, on the uh, west side. See a lot of red here on 151 approaching 1604. Some orange there on 1604 approaching 151. So let's take a look at a travel time uh, in that area. 11 minutes to get from 410 to 1604, only five minutes the other way. So that gives you a bit of the idea of a delay there in that area. Also taking a look at 35, we still have some issues downtown. So I'll take you 13 minutes from the northeast side to get to downtown from Loop 410, only 10 minutes in the other direction. Don't keep an eye on things this evening, and we'll have more coming up, Tim and Myra. All right, as we were talking about the uh, showers out there, you didn't see any on your side of town. I had them on mine, got caught in one on the walk today, and made for a very interesting commute into work this afternoon <laughs> along Bandera Road, where in Leon Valley, the medians were just flooding. Uh, yeah, Leon Valley has a tendency to see a quick rising water in parts of the Leon Valley. And, you know, it's the type of rain that can be a nuisance when you're on the roads. But overall, it's good for us. And it's nice to have this maintenance rain to maintain our lack of drought and to at times boost the aquifer if it falls in the right spot. And if you missed out today, you have more opportunities tomorrow. I think we're going to do the same thing all over again. Then we turn off the tap for the most part Thursday and Friday. So if you work outdoors, I think those will be the days when you can get the most work done through the afternoon and even into the early evening because the showers will be very limited. But we get into the weekend and we crank it up again and we start doing it all over again. So let's talk about this in general. First of all, looking at the radar right now, you take a look outside and we have more scattered activity dotting the landscape across South Texas and a good portion getting hit now, especially west of I-35 between I-35 and uh, the Rio Grande, we've got some areas of showers and thunderstorms out there. Not much in terms of lightning. You know, that's one thing I like about this type of weather pattern with these tropical downpours. You only see a few little lightning strikes out there. Not much. The white lines, those are the lightning strikes. And if we tilt upward, usually you can see them a little bit better. Not a whole lot of lightning out there. And that's one positive with these. So as we look ahead to the 4th of July, yeah, I think we'll see a lot of this activity during the daytime, but a lot of it you can actually play in. So if you have a pool party planned, I personally wouldn't cancel it, but just know if you hear thunder, it's time to go inside. Otherwise, this is the action that kids can get outside and uh, splash around in if they want. Looking at rainfall totals just today. Let's look at just the past 12 hours here and you see where the main swaths were right downtown San Antonio over an inch estimated there. You get up to Bernie right along I 10 around an inch and just over an inch estimated up in Bernie as well. So the haves and have nots. It's the kind of rain that's very streaky and this map illustrates that very well. So over the past nine hours, this is what the radar and satellite has looked like. Some sun, some downpours, tropical in nature, nothing severe. We're not expecting anything strong or severe in the days ahead. Now what's happening here is the upper level high, the big blue H, the heat dome. We've got one over Washington, D.C. A little part of that's going to peel off and head our way. And tomorrow it's more of the same, but I do anticipate us to turn off the tap a little bit by Thursday and Friday as this settles overhead. So that's when we see those rain chances dip back down to 10%. Then for the weekend, we do this all over again. Short lived, hit or miss, random, quick little downpours. 87 was our high today. It's nice to see that uh, drop in temperature. Lubbock only 77. El Paso had a high of 70. 87 Ambly Abilene. Meanwhile, Del Rio with more sunshine, not as much in terms of rain. 96 was their high temperature. Right now we've got 70s and 80s. Rain cooled air out there. 78 Kerrville, 78 Catula, 82 in Pleasanton. Tomorrow morning will be in the 70s, lower 70s by the afternoon. I'm thinking upper 80s for most of us again very briefly and we're going to be limited again uh, to the mid to upper 80s because of more showers and storms. So in the morning 20% by the afternoon 40% east southeast really breeze at 5 to 10 looking ahead. We warm up to the mid 90s Friday, but that's our peak upper 80s to near 90 this weekend when we get back into this pattern again. Not a bad stretch. Thanks Adam. All right, Greg, the Texas Longhorns get a commitment from someone that could help out with the running game. You know, what's interesting is the way college football works now is recruiting is like 24-7 yes. year-round. It doesn't stop. When we come back here, they do land a running back. That won't help them until next year. At the same time, the UTSA Roadrunners haul in a pass rusher for this coming season. Coming up.
Texas Longhorns received a huge commitment this week from Jamarian Miller, considered to be one of the best running backs available. The 5'10", 185-pound speedster selected UT over USC, Baylor, and Texas Tech, to name a few. He made the announcement on social media following his visit to the 40 Acres. I'm blessed to announce that I've decided to start my new journey at the University of Texas at Austin. I want to give a big thanks to my parents, coaches, and staff at UT for all the hard work and dedication they've invested into this. Hashtag hook em. It is time at Tyler Legacy. Miller has over 3,200 yards, rushing 24 touchdowns, and includes over 1,600 yards and 20 TDs just last year. Miller's the second top running back to commit to Texas for the class of 2022, including Jaden Blue out of Houston. Meantime, the UTSA Roadrunners head football coach Jeff Taylor has announced that he has added Jamari Robinson, one of the nation's top junior college pass rushers, to his roster beginning this coming season, 2021. Robinson is 6'5", 255 pounds, considered one of the top JUCO players in the nation, rated as number th a three-star prospect by 24-7 sports and rivals. And get this, he still has three years of college eligibility left. Before suiting up for Monroe College in New York, Robinson made first-team All-State and unanimous All-Conference honoree as a senior to Hayfield Secondary School in Virginia after leading the state in sacks. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Tanya Snyder, the wife of team owner Dan Snyder, has been named co-CEO of the Washington football team. That announcement was made today since she's also the co-owner of the team with her husband and now becomes one of the relatively few women CEOs in league history. The Snyder family gained complete control of the team when they bought out 40.5% of the team from minority owners. All this comes in the wake of two major developments, a complete rebranding of the team that will remain the Washington football team this coming season, and in the wake of an ongoing independent investigation after sexual harassment allegations were made by past employees, a span over 15-year period brought to light by the Washington Post. The Atlanta Hawks star player Trey Young is listed as still questionable for tonight's Game 4 against the Milwaukee Bucks in Atlanta, even though he's not warming up as we speak. That's after he suffered an injury during the closing moments of the third quarter in Game 3 against Milwaukee. When he gave up this turnover, he remained down in the court. And when you take a look at the replay, you can see he accidentally steps on the foot of official Sean Wright, who was out of bounds. They're calling it a sprained right ankle. Young went to the locker room only to return, but when he did, he was mostly ineffective, going just one for four. While Chris Middleton took over single-handedly outscoring the Hawks in the fourth quarter, 20 to 17 to finish with 38 points in the 132 to 102 victory giving Milwaukee a two game to one lead. An emotional moment today in sports as Mark Cavendish cried today after his 31st stage win at the Tour de France. You can see the veteran sprinter has been absent from cycling's biggest race for the past three years and was not even expected to be on the squad until Sam Bennett withdrew. Today he powered his way into his sprint to finish to take the fourth stage of the Tour de France. And what makes it even more gratifying for the 36-year-old? It comes after he was diagnosed with Epstein-Barr virus back in 2018 that forced him to take a break from cycling. A woman who held up a sign that caused a massive pileup in the first stage of the Tour de France is not only facing criminal charges, but French authorities also plan to file civil lawsuits against a woman who started a chain reaction when Tony Martin ran into her sign crash, causing a domino effect resulting in injuries and damage. She has reportedly fled the country. Now, one of the clues to where they may be able to find her is that sign is a kind of a cross between French and German. It says, go grandpa, grandma. They believe she may have fled to her home country of Germany. We'll see. Good luck finding her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. In today's KSAT Q&A, as we are most Tuesdays, we are joined by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg to talk with us about a variety of topics. Mayor, thanks for being here as always. Uh, we saw that you were part of the visit with the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas earlier today. He toured a vaccination site here. Seems like he was complimentary of what San Antonio has done so far, but the work is not over. So give us an update if you can about where we are locally with this vaccination effort as a lot of people concerned about this Delta variant. Yeah, well, I, I'll tell you that the Biden administration, as many folks know, has placed a bold goal for July 1, really the July 4th break uh, to have uh, the numbers of Americans vaccinated. Uh, I think that the administration is going to fall slightly short of that goal. But here in San Antonio, uh, we are going to exceed that goal. And in fact, uh, we have now almost 73% of our population have had at least one dose of the vaccination. We also know that um, almost 58% have been fully vaccinated. Uh, we're approaching now almost a million people that are fully vaccinated in our community. So those are great numbers. He was here uh, to tour 
the Wonderland Mall mass vaccination site, which is one of the first um, operating in the in the country and has been one of the best in the country. So again, showing off the, the teamwork and collaboration has gotten us through this pandemic uh, to this point and also um, at the point where we are now exceeding the federal goals that have been set for vaccination. But your point, Myra, is a good one. We know that the Delta variant has already been detected in Austin. We are sure from public health officials that it's here present in our community. And the importance of that is that if folks are vaccinated, they are protected against the Delta variant. Uh, it's more infectious, but the vaccination protects you. The challenge is if you are not fully vaccinated, we're finding that the level of immunity before you get your second dose is much lower than in the previous mutations of the virus. So people are encouraged. If you are eligible, go get a vaccination. We've got plenty available for you. And if you've only gotten one dose, you need to continue to protect yourself until you get that second dose of the vaccine. May, if we can uh, shift gears here real quickly and go to the uh, winter storm, the emergency preparedness uh, committee released its report last week, uh, a number of recommendations. What are the biggest takeaways for you from that report? How many of those recommendations are going to be implemented and what are your top priorities? Well, I, I think we need to implement all of them. And, I, and I've told our boards of governance at CPS and SAWS uh, and the city council here that we need to own uh, we need to take ownership of those recommendations and, and do what we uh, can do that's within our control. Some of the findings of the report are no surprise, uh, and chiefly among them, that the state management of the energy system has set up the entire state for failure. However, there are things and many things that were pointed out in the report that we can do better. Uh, first and foremost, we need to ensure that our local infrastructure is weatherized to the extent that we can. Uh, and that includes our plants, our generation uh, capacity. It also means ensuring there's backup capacity for energy for critical infrastructure like our saws pumping stations. It also uh, suggests that we need to do a better job in preparation and training for contingencies that maybe 10 years ago may not have been conceived. A winter event and a storm um, caused outage uh, of energy that would last for this long was not anticipated in any emergency of the documentation. So we need to plan for contingencies that were once unfathomable. And then, of course, uh, from the CPS side, when we are forced into uh, shedding load, which is what happened with ERCOT's management of the grid, when we are forced into turning off circuits, making those circuits that have to be turned off smaller so that we don't affect such a greater, such a great uh, portion of the population. So there's a number of things that we can take, that we can do. Some of which are being done immediately, but we need to make sure that uh, all of this is done in an accountable, transparent manner, and that there's uh, updates to the city council that can be part of public viewing. Uh, I will tell you uh, that the report itself is available for download. Anyone can go on and, and take a look at it. You can go to sanantonio.gov slash emergency dash preparedness. Take a look at the report and also keep us keep uh, tuned to that website to, to ensure that your your city council and the boards of governance of the utilities are doing the right things according to these reports. Another big issue for the city that we've been talking about for months, negotiations with the San Antonio Police Officers Association on a new contract. You are not in the room for those negotiations, so I understand there's there's not an update from your personal perspective. But can you talk to us about what happens if a deal is not reached by the time their current contract sure. expires, which that's at the end of September? Yeah, and, and uh, first I'll tell you that the, the negotiation sessions uh, themselves are public meetings, so people can uh, can can watch and stay tuned to what's happening in the actual negotiations. However, uh, with respect to the negotiation progress, we want to get a contract in which uh, there's better accountability and disciplinary transparency uh, that, that we can hold uh, accountable in the contract. So uh, if those, a deal is not reached and we fall short of those objectives to give our chief the authority uh, to hire and fire and to ensure that there's proper transparency and accountability of our police department, if that contract agreement falls short and a contract is not reached, the contract that we are under right now expires on September 30th. If that happens, it triggers an evergreen clause in which most of the provisions remain in place, but the officers themselves are not going to receive compensation increases um, outside of those promotions that might occur. 
So it's in the benefit of members of the police uh, association, those good police officers who uh, themselves are not part of the disciplinary process for, for their careers to ensure that we are continuing the good faith negotiations and achieving the objectives that city wants to reach in terms of accountability measures that should be commonplace in every department across the country. So we are anxiously awaiting the results uh, and the conclusion of the negotiation. I have uh, good reason uh, to be confident uh, that the good faith negotiations will achieve that result that we want in terms of a good contract for the public, for the city, and, and for the members of the police department themselves. A few more months left before that deal expires uh, at the end of September. Mayor Ron Nirenberg, thanks so much for being with us. Great to be with you. Have a great day. Thank you, Mayor. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. I want to tell you about a virtual public hearing that TxDOT is underway that started just about an hour ago. It's, it's uh, not only is it virtual, you can check on it when you want to. Uh, and it's through July 14th. This, we're talking about Bandera Road between the loops, Loop 410 to 1604. What you want to see happen here with this road in terms of improving uh, traffic capacity, connections, and the like, uh, go to text.gov. You can search uh, Bandera Road on that, and again, you can provide your input uh, through July 14th. Taking a look at the uh, road right now, things look okay uh, for this hour, 11 to 13 minutes in each direction. We're still watching this situation, 151 at 1604. Here's how it looks on the map. Got a little better view here of that backup on the west side, so watch out for that. Tim and Myra. All right, thanks, Samuel. Look outside with live cam. Plenty of places seeing rain today. This I was is good rainbow weather. It is. It is good rainbow weather, and it also provided a cool breeze. Yes. I was out of the Seguin area today, and the breeze was actually nice. It's nice to have these pop-up showers. Of course, you get some rainbows out there. Remember, you can only see a rainbow with your back to the sun. Right now, we're 78 degrees. Not bad for this time of day, considering it's late June. We'll be falling gradually through the 70s through the evening and tonight, and our showers are coming to an end shortly after sunset, but more opportunities in the forecast. We'll see you in a bit. And check out the new spokes baby for Gerber. This is four-month-old Zane Kahin of Florida. Gerber chose little Zane as the winner of this year's photo contest. That would be for the food, not for me. <laughs> the company says that means he will be the official taste tester for new baby food products. It is also giving him a title, Chief Growing Officer, which is a <laughs> first for Gerber. The prize also includes $25,000 in cash. The first Gerber baby who won the contest in 1928, Ann Turner Cook, is now 94 years old. I am wow. not a part of that Gerber family. If I was, I wouldn't be standing here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you guys called your little one the Gerber baby. Oh, yes. When she first came along. Absolutely. To, right? Yep. New Harry Potter anything always creates a buzz with fans of the boy wizard and a new show is coming to Broadway. Harry Potter and the Cursed Child will make its premiere in November. The play is set 19 years after Harry, Ron and Hermione save the wizarding world. A new generation of kids will be attending Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and wizardry, but Harry, Ron, and Hermione, while older, are still around. The reimagined Harry Potter and the Cursed Child debuts at the Lyric Theater on November 16th. Today is a good day to capture a beautiful moment. It is National Camera Day. A lot of us carry them around all day long thanks to smartphones. Cameras have come a long way since they first entered the world. George Eastman, known as the father of photography, didn't invent the camera, but he brought it to the masses, and we take a lot of pictures from selfies to the food on our plates, animals, kids. According to Business Insider, we took 1.2 trillion pictures in 2017, and probably only about 100 of them were ever printed out. Right? You have to remind yourself. Yes. I, I got to do something with these. They're all on computers and hard drives. I don't know where I'm Cloud. ever going to find them. Yeah. yeah. The pictures of food, though, that's one I just can't. Yeah, no. I can't get behind that one. Mm -mm. I bet you take pictures of beer. Have you taken pictures of beer? Oh, oh homemade beer. Yeah, homebrew. Yes. Yeah, and and barbecue at home, right? Yes. In the pit. Yes, okay. absolutely. That is that is food worth taking a picture of. Ah, okay. So we've got there's you know, stipulations categories. Here. 
for the food photos. Exactly. Okay. When you fire up the pit and you get that fire going, oh yeah, yeah. The progress is made. Things mm. dads love. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, so good, so good. That and thermometers, right? Every dad just mm -hmm. loves thermometers. Oh yeah. All right, so we do have more rain <laughs> chances on the way. If you missed out on it the past couple of days, you have another chance, but it's not going to be equal every day. We're not just stuck in this same pattern day after day. By the 4th of July, we are anticipating some of this activity. We're telling you right now, but don't go canceling your plans because this is really non severe and typically we don't even have a lot of lightning and thunder with it. So let, let's take a look at this and talk about it right now. Some activity farther west of San Antonio, just highly basically scattered or even isolated, you could call it now. There really isn't a whole lot of coverage of that shower activity that's west of San Antonio. I mean, there's a little bit here and there, especially northern Valverde County getting clipped by some of these downpours and you get farther south down I-35, Pearsall, Dilly area and just outside of I-35 seeing some of those showers and downpours. Locally, we switch radar sites to get a better view of this and what's left over over the past hour. A little bit of act activity from Bulverde, south of Canyon Lake, up into Kendall County, and some left over in Gonzales. A lot of this is coming to an end, but it's just a fraction of what we had earlier today. Again, a lot of this, not even much in terms of wind with it, nor even lightning and thunder. That's going to be the case for the 4th of July. I know you're all making plans personally, I would keep the outdoor plans. Just be prepared to run inside or under a roof or shelter for a brief period of time. And if you don't have any thunder, that means you don't have lightning. Keep swimming if you want. You can stay outside and play in this kind of rain in many situations. Not always, but in many situations. Another active day across the state. Good maintenance rain, but we're watching this heat high over Washington, D.C. A little piece of that is going to branch off and head our way, and that's gonna sit overhead for Thursday and Friday. So notice Wednesday, more of the same, similar pop-up afternoon downpours during the peak heating of the day. And we get into Thursday and Friday, and I think for the most part here in our area of Central and South Texas, we'll be turning off the tap for two days. We get into the weekend, and it all starts up again. So by Saturday and the 4th of July on into next week. I think it's going to be more of what we have had the past couple of days. Look what it does to temperatures though. Bulverde 76, 79 in Tarpley, 79 Helotus, Port SA at 77. Get up to 87 in Del Rio, but there and even Dryden at 90. Those are some of the hot spots on the map. Not bad for this time of year. Tomorrow, we'll start the day at 73 then make it up to about 88 again for the high temperature. A few isolated sprinkles or hit or miss showers in the morning. And then by the time we get to the afternoon hours, we'll see better chances and more of this widely separated downpour activity that really only lasts for about an hour or so after sunset. That's what we're dealing with right now. As the sun goes down, those showers and storms start to fade away. We lose the sunlight. We lose those showers and storms Thursday and Friday. Lower rain chances, very minimal, so a little bit warmer back into the mid 90s by Friday, but then into the weekend. There you have it. These pop up afternoon showers here and there hit or miss brief in nature, but good maintenance rain. OK, thanks, Adam. In case you missed it coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. Good morning. It is Tuesday, June 29th. Yeah, this afternoon, the Bear County Sheriff's Office arrested a former juvenile detention officer. 31 year old Ramon Montagna was arrested for alleged injury to a child with serious bodily injury, which is a first degree felony. He was also charged with assault bodily injury. New at five, we now know the name of the man found with a fatal injury behind a bus stop Monday morning on the city's northwest side. According to the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office, that man has been identified as 22 year old Troy Demetrius Lee. They say Lee had several stab wounds to his back and abdomen. San Antonio police say they found Lee around 2 a.m. yesterday lay, lying on a hill near a bus stop on Ingram Road. A side man recovering from cuts that he suffered during a knife fight outside of his home. According to San Antonio police, the victim was cut in his arm during an argument at around 11 o'clock last night in the 100 block of Taos Street near Brady Boulevard. SAPD says the suspects believed to be a man who is around 80 years old. The victim taken to a hospital. He is expected to be okay. At last check, the slashing suspect has not been found.
A new study finds that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines could offer protection that lasts years, even without a booster shot. Researchers found nearly four months after the second shot, there was still a strong immune response, essentially training the body long term to fight off infection. This comes as growing concerns about the highly contagious Delta variant that's now showing up in 49 states. Already seeing some delays in eastern Bear County. I-10 at 1604. It's going to be closed at interchange beginning at 9, but already seeing a slowdown there. Also still watching this situation on the west side, 151 at loop 1604. You can see police vehicles still on the scene there. Traffic being diverted there at that ramp. Also watching this situation downtown Adam, I-37 at Jones. And we have a few lingering showers that will slowly be coming to an end this evening. Otherwise, tomorrow, I think we just do this all over again in the upper 80s briefly. Some scattered downpours here and there, random in nature in the afternoon. And then we're mainly dry Thursday and Friday, so back in the 90s then. But this weekend, we'll get right back into this pattern with those random afternoon pop-up downpours. So get ready for that 4th of July. All right. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the news at 6. See you back here for the night beat tonight at 10. Until then, have a good evening.